Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and I am delighted to be kicking off our very first episode with our special guest, Nick Esposito. Welcome, Nick. We're really glad to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here, Mira. So, Nick, you're the Zero Waste and Litter Director for the City of Philadelphia. How about if we start off with you just telling us what that means? Sure. So um, this is an initiative that came out of the Mayor's Office of Philadelphia and the Managing Director's Office. Um, and basically, it uh, was started by an executive order by Mayor Kenny back in December of 2016. It kind of came out of two places. Um, when he was candidate Kenny on the campaign trail, like many mayors before him and many politicians, he heard a lot about the litter problems that Philadelphia has faced for generations. Um, you know, a lot of times people consider Philly to be one of the heavily uh, dirtiest and littered cities in the United States. So he knew that um, something needed to be done about that and something different than the way it was done before. Um, a lot more of a collaborative process, really getting many different departments and stakeholders to really understand what role they can play and how they can make a difference uh, in this. Then at the same time, we had the Greenworks plan, which I always, I, it's, this is a, I admire Mayor Kenny for doing this in, in many ways that um, he was able to kind of carry on what Mayor Nutter had created, this beautiful plan that kind of set the sustainability framework for the city of Philadelphia and just kind of continued it on um, into his administration. Um, so the Greenworks plan called for reductions in waste, moving towards zero waste goals. So when the mayor sat down with the managing director and they started talking about this, you know, they didn't look at these as two separate issues. They looked at, you know, if you can really upgrade our waste management practices, you're going to improve the litter conditions. And if you really get people to think about the litter conditions and how they really want to clean up their city, you're going to get them to buy into these new waste management systems. So it was this kind of feedback loop that wanted to be created. And that's really what went into the executive order. Basically what the cat, what was created was a cabinet that brings together departments, private stakeholders, other agencies kind of outside of city government that can get together and come up with a coordinated plan uh, to basically put us on a path to zero waste by 2035 and work on a litter free future now. Um, so we put an action plan out. We had six months to create it, and we did. Um, very happy that we hit our deadline uh, in the summer of 2017, and now we're in the process of implementing that plan in Philadelphia. So, what what kind of responsibilities do you have as director of this initiative? Um, so, when people ask me that, I give two examples. One, um, I have a community organizing background, and I think this is probably one of the biggest community organizing gigs that I could get right now. Um, yeah. And really, that's my job is to keep everyone kind of at the table, working together, understand their stake in it. You know, you're dealing with, you know, community members, obviously, and there's community mm -hmm. organizing there. But even within the departments, you know, you're dealing with departments that have budgets and they're tasked with very, you know, important um, things that are just like the base of their operation. Sanitation picks up our trash. License and inspections make sure that buildings are safe for people. Um, but there's so much that comes in there with waste and trash and litter, obviously, that I need to be able to work with those people um, and those departments to keep them at the table to make sure that we're kind of coordinating and moving forward together. The other thing I say is, um, thankfully for my job, there was a lot of things already in place. This isn't a, a new concept that these departments are like, oh, thank you, Nick and the mayor for coming and figuring this out for us. People have been wanting to do this work for a while. So I always joke that it's almost like someone just, we dumped out all the puzzle pieces on the table and now we're all putting this puzzle together to get that clear picture of what we, our goal is. Well, that's, it's a really lofty goal, zero waste. So um, I don't think we said that the mandate is to be zero waste to landfill by 2035, right? Yes, that's correct. So that's huge. And um, <laughs> <laughs> even, that's huge, but also um, the litter thing is huge. I mean, the thing is, and litter is a little different because waste, sometimes you don't really are able to confront it. You put it in your bin and it kind of goes away somewhere which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about the intricacies of that in a little bit. But with litter, I mean, it's something that confronts us every day. I live in a neighborhood that's redeveloping very rapidly. I feel like I live in a construction zone, which is dirty in its own right, but also the litter that has been accumulating. You see it every day, and yeah. that's an overwhelming thing to people. They think, like, yeah, how are we going to do zero waste when we, the city looks the way that it does? And we're, it, it, it feels overwhelming, but, again, having that puzzle put it together, we really feel like we're making the right moves to – um, 
to really make some change on this. So one of the things that probably needs to change is the way that people perceive their trash or their consumption or their litter, any of those things, yes? Yes, that's very true. So how are you guys helping to educate the public? So we have a few different outreach uh, pieces. Um, the first uh, is a website that we created called cleanphl.org. Um, and what this website basically came out of was coming to community meetings and community members saying, you know, we don't want to have to go to five city websites to find out five different things about litter. Um, like I would go out and people would ask me questions that, um, you know, these are civically engaged people that really want to do good and they couldn't find this information. And that's a problem, right? There's a user problem there. We're in a really cool place in city government where we're thinking through our design and our um, issues through with that lens to think about how are, like, look, let's look at our residents as users and how are they using our services. So Clean PHL brings that all together, makes those resources uh, as accessible as possible. It also has a certain, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I just want to say that whatever resources we're discussing, I just wanted people to be aware that they're going to be available through links on the notes for the podcast. So whatever um, we talk about, people will be able to gain access to through the sustainabilitynow.global website. So go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. So on the litter side, you know, there's a lot of ways to clean up litter and all the information that we all want. But another big thing on the website is we did an entire citywide litter index. We had six departments go out, um, 37 staff members. They took 42,000 data points of our streets, our vacant wow. lots, our schools, our parks, our waterways, our uh, train stations to get the clearest picture of what litter looks like. Uh, every block is now assigned a score and then every small neighborhood is assigned a score. You can search your score and then also find the resources that you have or you don't have on your block that we feel is what keeps blocks clean. And that's ways that we're trying to engage the public um, in that. And is that litter map on cleanphl.org? Yep. And um, when you first go to the website, you'll see the entire map of the city. So you can kind of see what the city looks like. Cause again, that's another big thing. We're not just doing this in certain neighborhoods. This is for the entire city of Philadelphia. All of our neighborhoods need to get across the board, the same resources, the same treatments to get us to a real litter free um, future. So how are you reaching the members of the community? I understand that you have these resources that people can go to, but without knowing about them, they don't, they don't have a step to find them, right? Mm -hmm. So how do, how do you um, popularize this, it, people's awareness around this? So from the litter, so the litter is the great entry point because people really want to clean up litter. So we go out to community meetings, we get asked to go all the time because people want to clean their neighborhoods up. So to have these kind of very, I think, unique and very um, sophisticated resources, people are responding very well um, to that and using them. So that's one way that we're being able to go out. We have a, um, a communications and engagement subcommittee of the cabinet. The cabinet has five subcommittees. One of them is communications and engagement. And we have all the collaborating agencies on the same social media messages, same website messages, and we're all sharing how to message this out using unified, you know, we're not having, again, five different departments making five different flyers about the same issue. They're all using the same flyer that we created together. The other side, and this kind of gets a little more into the waste on, and you can find a lot of this on clean PHL is uh, the fill a cycle program. So again, we had an existing program in Philadelphia through the recycle bank. It's a national um, organization and they had the recycling rewards where you got rewarded for putting your blue bin, uh, your single stream recycling bin um, outside and you can get, uh, you know, different discounts and gift cards and things like that from their site. Wow. We were able to take that program, couple it with a few other things we were doing in the city and create Phil a cycle, a Philly centric program that is um, rewards people the same way that the program worked before, but it's a way that we also can engage not just homeowners who put a blue bin out, but um, people in the neighborhoods to actually really start thinking about their waste. So we have trainings every uh, quarter to make Phil a cycle captains. And these captains are trained in volunteering at our zero waste events uh, learning how to do zero waste cleanups in their neighborhood. And we have stock presentations basically where they can go out into their neighborhoods and present to their community members about zero waste and anti-litter efforts and things of that nature. So basically we're trying to create an on the ground army of people that are in the neighborhoods constantly getting out in a peer to peer neighbor to neighbor um, outreach. Well, you just made mention of the zero waste events. And I saw on the website that uh, the 2017 Philadelphia Marathon achieved zero waste. Certainly uh, sure did. It was, so how about if you tell us about that? Because that's a monumental accomplishment. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, I think the event is 50,000 people over uh, two days. It's, 
it's a huge event that we're able to achieve zero waste. Um, and the history behind that is in 2011, um, the city rep's office was responsible for putting on the marathon. Um, there was a great uh, person named Kyle Lewis who worked in, the, in that department and she was just passionate about zero waste and kind of gave us the first framework for how to do zero waste events. Um, after that happened, she started working more with sustainability to kind of fine tune the programs. We had a program called Waste Watchers. They got people to go out and stand behind bins and actually tell people, mm -hmm. this is recyclable, that's compostable, that's trash. As it kind of grew, um, Parks and Rec ended up taking over the event. Um, I was actually working at Parks and Rec at the time and I was a sustainability manager before this whole initiative started and we were trying to really take that model and move it to other events. We we're having a tough time doing it, um, replicating the event. Um, so with the cabinet coming together, it gave us the actual the leverage, um, creating the PhiloCycle program, we kind of absorb Waste Watchers into that. Um, now we're able to kind of ramp it up where this, uh, you know, seven years later, the two or the six years later, 2017, um, Marathon is still a zero waste event. So we're continuing doing that. And this year, I think we're consulting just this spring on six zero waste events. Wow. Um, so if we can do that every season to the fall, that's 18 zero waste events that we did when we used to just do one. So this is really exciting because now it's going to start growing and building. And our hope is that, you know, we have hundreds of zero waste events out of the thousands of events that happen. Um, and now we have, we never had mandated recycling at events. Now that it's all mandated through the permits. Right. So we're really excited about this. Right. And I, I just, I think that's awesome that the um, recycling has become con a condition of getting the permit. That's really a big step. So I, I just pulled a couple of statistics. There were 17 tons of waste that were generated from that event, and it, none of it went to the landfills. It, it got recycled. It got compost, composted. Well, about 10% of it. So at 10 oh, okay. 17 um, tons went to, that's what kind of got us to the 90% diversion, which we do follow. It's like the kind of national standard for um, zero waste. So there's okay. a be some waste that you're just not going to be able to keep out of the landfill the way that packaging happens. Um, okay. Ninety percent threshold is what we go for. That's amazing. It's very impressive. So um, let's talk about what people can actually do to support uh, support your initiative, but also just to uh, be more responsible consumers. How can we? What What do we need to do to reduce waste? Yeah, so I think, you know, again, taking a really long look at the entire disposable culture that's been created in our plan, you know, we gave a statistic that since the 1960s, um, we're putting out three times the amount of trash curbside. Uh, and why is that? You know, it's because prices of globalization, you know, everything that's been going on about how cheap products are that we're able to buy, um, this idea that, you know, instead of washing dishes, we have disposable cups and plates. You know, you're seeing dishwashers being taken out of schools and they're getting disposable trays now with food that's already packed on it. There's a cultural shift there and we kind of need to think of, you know, obviously there was reasons why some of those things happened um, with budgets or with trying to get more food out to people, whatever it may be. We want to ensure that, you know, we're serving people the same way that we are, but, and that we need to, especially the city government, but that we're doing correct with the waste that's being put out. And with consumers, you know, this, it's just an explosion of abundance, I guess you can call it. And it's caused something um, that's been a really big challenge for us to keep up with uh, that's going into our landfills. So um, when we talk to people, we have a whole list on cleanphl.org of uh, zero waste tips um, that basically, you know, talk about ways that you can just make a difference in your daily life. Um, trying to buy things that are reusable, durable products that last, that aren't throwaway, really reducing your amount of packaging, buying in bulk, trying to, Think about, you know, not buying single packaged things, but maybe a collection of them in one box, you know, things of that nature. Um, and just trying to just be more just aware of it. Um, I mean, you got to take steps towards this. And I think the biggest step is just getting people to reconnect back to sanitation that, you know, you just don't put everything in a bin. It gets put out and then it just magically disappears somewhere. It has to right. go somewhere. Something has to happen with it. Um, we're real excited about food waste is a big thing. Um, we hope that we're trying to inspire more people to think about composting, whether it's in their backyards or installing a garbage disposal, or um, maybe there's a couple of surfaces and we're trying to really build that out. You just put on the municipal side of food waste. And that really connects people to, you know, that apple core that you ate, you put it in your compost, you put it in, you kind of know what's happening to it um, after. So these are ways that we're really trying to just um, awaken people to what's going on. Well, I, some of the statistics, I, I just have to go back to the marathon because I think that there were things that were that 
were handled as waste that a lot of us wouldn't normally think of. So compost, there was two and 2.14 tons of compost sent to Fairmount Park Organics Recycling Center. I didn't know that there was a Fairmount Park Organics Recycling Center. So just seeing some of these statistics is amazing. Um, over five and a half tons of recycle, uh, recyclables that were bought to uh, the Republic Transfer Station and um, metals, extra metals, 0.7 tons. I, I, I mean, that's almost a ton of metals. That's hard to imagine. Yeah. It's just crazy. And one of the things that I thought was amazing and wonderful is that uh, there were two and a half tons of unconsumed food and drink that got donated to Phil Abundance. So for anybody that doesn't know about Phil Abundance, can you just give us a little bit of a background on them? Sure, Phil Abundance um, is uh, one of um, a few very large scale um, food uh, kind of recovery uh, operations in the city of Philadelphia. Um, they've been a huge partner in the work that we've been doing. Um, and, you know, again, we talk about our diversion rate, how we're trying to keep material out of the landfill. Um, a lot of times when you start talking about these things, what gets overlooked out of the three R's is the reduce, which we could talk about, but also, you know, the reuse is thinking, like, how do we take something that's perfectly good and not let it go to the landfill? Like, yeah. Especially in a city with a 25% poverty rate, yeah. it's crazy that we're throwing food or furniture or any kinds of goods in a landfill if they can be used again. So yes. those are things that we think through. Um, Phil Abundance um, basically works with, you know, very large operators that take in food, takes them to the warehouse and then redistributes them back out the food cupboards. Uh, there are also smaller operations in the city um, that are doing this as well. We have a whole food recovery network that we work with. Um, but just a stat on Phil Abundance, I think in 2016 or 17, they kept 17 million pounds of food out of the landfill. And that's Huge. That's awesome. Yeah. So are they also recovering food from uh, supermarkets and restaurants? Um, I, I definitely supermarkets. I think on larger restaurants that you try to work with larger partners, a lot of it comes from the food distribution um, center down in South Philadelphia and Southwest Philadelphia, okay. um, where there's food that's coming in on the docks and then it's being put out. A lot of there's a lot of waste that goes on there. So they're very successful down there. But again, we have smaller programs um, that uh, are able to do uh, food recovery, and we're trying to connect with them a lot more um, and, you know, just get this, again, in people's culture to say, you know, if you have leftover food, it should be donated and not thrown away. And the same with clothes. It was really interesting here. Uh, there were three and a half tons of clothing that uh, donated, and it was to a group called Chosen 300. What is that? Chosen 300 is a, um, a service organization that mostly serves with uh, homeless populations and things of that nature. Um, so they're, you know, again, a great partner. Um, there's other, you know, obviously uh, examples of things like this, like the Goodwill, and there's a lot of thrift stores that have similar missions in the city of Philadelphia. And I always, you know, tell people, sometimes they don't think about this, but every time you pack a bag up with clothes that you don't want anymore, or furniture, especially, I, I have two kids right now, we're constantly like clothes, toys, baby gear. Um, to throw any of that out when it's usable is crazy, right? They, you have these yeah. options that we take it right to the thrift store. And every time you do that, that's a zero waste technique that you're using. You know, it might be, you might be doing it out of the goodness of your heart. You want to serve um, lower income people, whatever it may be, but you're keeping stuff out of the landfill as well. And that's a huge benefit. Well, I think that's a really important point, actually, because when we think about recycling, not too many people think about clothes. No, you know? no. So, um, and we are, have become such a throwaway society. It's th what you're looking to do is one of the things that, that is part of our mission is to shift paradigms. You know, you're really looking, yeah, to create a whole new mindset. It has to happen. It's definitely. So one of the things, um, well, let's, let's talk about you. How did you find your way to this position? <laughs> Um, it's a little windy of a path, so I'll give you the, the quick version. Um, I started off uh, in college as an English major, and uh, the, I always joke about English majors is we can do anything with our English major except get jobs in the field of it. You know, <laughs> That's right. Teach. It's very nebulous what you're going to go out and do. So again, I, I do credit it with giving me very good research skills, a lot of curiosity, and just trying to really think, what am I going to do with this book? After I graduated, I joined the National Civilian Community Corps of the AmeriCorps. Um, and was stationed out in California. Basically, it's a program that 
meets uh, unmet needs. So it does a lot of disaster relief, uh, things of that nature. Um, this was in 2006. This was right after Hurricane Katrina. So all of us mm -hmm. were being um, sent to the Gulf Coast to go help out after the storm. I rebuilt houses. Um, and in that time, got one, I got the service bug. And I realized just how soul satisfying and important it was to be in service to your fellow people. Uh, and then also kind of at the same time, this was just happenstance. This was like Michael Pollan has just wrote, uh, written the uh, Omnivore's Dilemma. And there was a lot of, you know, the Cajuns were, a, the Creoles were a very land-based society that kind of, you know, shifted a lot of their economy to oil and kind of got away from it. And they were, there was a lot of conversations around, especially as they were rebuilding, well, how do we rebuild in these areas? Like, what do we think of for our state? And uh, kind of just fell into urban agriculture and even rural agriculture, um, living in the cities and the, and the country around Louisiana and Mississippi. And, um, you know, I ended up doing a project out in Seattle because based off of our interests, our team really got interested in this and uh, got into urban agriculture, um, which got me back into Philadelphia, got into, there's an incredible urban ag scene here. Um, and it's funny because I credit a lot of what I do in my mindset of having a farming background now because farmers are some of the best people you can think of about waste. There's no waste if you run a farm correctly, right? Uh, and farmers are just, they're known for their ingenuity. They can make any something out of anything, you know, mm -hmm. when you're on the farm. So Kind of got that in my mind. Um, that led to a job with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society doing horticulture, public horticulture, which led to get me in the Department of Parks and Recreation. And kind of the turning point that where I really got here was uh, I took all of this knowledge, all of this excitement about landscapes and how to better community through horticulture and agriculture. And I was working with our grounds maintenance people and getting them really excited about planting and pruning and mulching and all this great stuff that they should be doing. And they would turn to me and say, Nick, we love what you're teaching us, but we can't apply it because most of our day is spent picking up trash in our parks. And I did a study, so I was like, okay, what does that really look like? And I found that 60% of a um, parks and rec maintenance person's day is picking up trash because people litter our parks and don't you know, treat them correctly. So this really weighed on me when this opportunity came up to start contributing to this cabinet and then it ultimately um, directed, you know, taking all of that kind of life experience, the service, the consciousness about sustainability and waste and just to want to advocate for our, you know, municipal workers and our residents who just want to live in cleaner, better places. Um, it all kind of culminated into this. Well, you, you mentioned service and you said that that really gave you a sense of purpose and meaning, uh, or at least that's what I heard. I don't know if those were your exact sure. words. Sure. So I, I really, because that's part of what we're up to, I really would like to hear a little bit more about that journey for you, what, what it's meant and how you got there. Yeah, no, you know, I consider myself a like lifelong public servant, no matter what I'm doing. I mean, I'm happy to be in city government. I hope to stay here. But um, whatever I do, I always be in service to uh, my fellow human uh, being. And uh, we do that. My wife and I also run Emerald Street Community Farm, which is an urban farm project that my wife started 10 years ago um, that uh, I came into eight years ago. We've been co-managing ever since. Um, you know, basically the way the farm works is that we grow food with our community. It's completely free. Anyone can come. They can work as much as they want. Mm. They can work as little. They could take as much food or as little food. And again, it's just that kind of idea of really working this into your lifestyle. I think that's something that I learned from, you know, the AmeriCorps and Triple C is a really intense program. You're working on a team, you're traveling, you're being shipped out to, you know, one minute you're in Sacramento, the next minute you're in, you know, Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, you're living in tents mm. on the beach and your day is basically spent working and then going back and being with your team. And, it became a lifestyle, a lifestyle of service, basically. And that's something that is like stuck with me and uh, what I um, continue to try to do um, every day in my life. And, uh, you know, it's really what we bring to the work. And, you know, Philly is, you know, I know public servants and municipal workers and city government can get a bad rap, but I mean, the people I work with are just incredible. They're dedicated people. They're up against major challenges, but they're some of the most creative, you know, dedicated people that I know. Um, and to wake up every day to go to work for one and a half million people is pretty big privilege. Wow. That's awesome. So you also uh, sort of slid in the, the Philly urban farming uh, community or movement. I added another thing that is flying under my radar up until recently. So can you tell us about that? I mean, Philadelphia has had an urban ag like aspect to it since William Penn founded the city. I mean, when you look at the plans of 1681 that he drew up, um, he made allotments for gardens and agriculture within the city. That was wow. something that was built into the DNA of the city. Um, then throughout that, we've had, you know, many different um, pieces. Uh, you know, there was a lot of farmland that was around Philly before it was incorporated in 1856. 
late 1800s, you had a lot of um, lot reclamation because, you know, the city was redeveloping, it was a manufacturing hub, and it started losing some, you know, that's been kind of Philly's history for the last like 120 years, and um, how to sustain lots. And there's been so many programs. Um, the Neighbor Gardens Association started in the 50s, coming out of the Victory Gardens that were very popular here in World War II, um, all the way to the 70s where you had, you know, activists, primarily a lot of African-American activists, um, who were really trying to work to stabilize their communities when we were losing a lot of population um, to create agriculture um, in a lot of communities around Philadelphia. Um, and then to today, you know, there's this kind of the, the newest wave, I guess, that we're still kind of in the midst of. Again, it was around that time of 2006, this, you know, local food movement, a lot of people were getting excited. Um, this is also a time that Philly was redeveloping and it was attracting a lot of people from around the country um, who, you know, came with a lot of good ideals, um, wanting to better or, you know, to grow food in a community. Um, but what I think has been really impressive and really interesting um, that, you know, and it doesn't always work out this way, but a lot of people who do come here learn a lot about the existing communities um, that had been here, primarily African-American communities who've been doing a lot of really good work. Um, and now we're, you know, a lot of the lens that Urban Ag is being looked through right now is through uh, social justice and uh, especially racial equity. Um, you know, there's a lot of issues around gentrification and African-American communities, um, you know, being affected by, you know, something you would think that coming in, especially as an outsider, primarily white, you know, you're doing something really good, starting a garden in a neighborhood and uh, really getting people to look at some of the other aspects, you know, who controls the conversation around how land is used and things of that nature. So we have a lot of really great um, African-American led um, urban farm uh, organizations that are um, working really hard in the city. You're trying to get that into the conversation. Uh, again, it's not just about growing food. It's about the history of the city, equity in the city and how we move forward as one. So if people want to learn more about how to get involved with the urban farming movement here in Philadelphia area, or even in their own cities, do you have some recommendations of where they could go to get more information? Um, so in Philadelphia, primarily, um, we have the um, Pennsylvania Horticultural Society and their city harvest program. They have a lot mm -hmm. of information about the gardens that they serve. And basically they have, a, we're uh, Emerald Street, which I co-manage is one of those gardens. We grow food that is made available to donate um, into the, back into the community. Um, so there's a good network there. Also, Philadelphia has a very strong food policy advisory council. Um, it's ran out of the Office of Sustainability um, and does a lot of great work around food issues, again, from everything from hunger relief to urban farm and vacant land policy to those equity issues that I was discussing before. So those are two really great uh, pieces in Philly. Um, Nationally, you know, there's a lot of uh, organiz I would say, you know, for anybody who's in a city, right, I think the best place you could probably start is with your sustainability office if you have one. Um, and if not, your probably parks and recreation system. A lot of times uh, urban agriculture is um, wrapped in the parks and recreation. Our parks and recreation has Farm Philly, which is also a great program. That is how to um, resource and support uh, community gardening and agriculture on um, our public uh, park property. Um, so those would be some tips. Okay, well, again, just for folks that are listening, we'll make sure to post links to these different organizations and sites. So um, let's get back to litter and, um, and recycling and trash. Um, I've checked out your websites and saw that you have amazing resources. Again, we're going to link to those. And I, it was actually quite an education for me to read through the things that you can and cannot recycle. Mm -hmm. So I thought that maybe we could provide our audience with some tips that, they, that are actionable and also uh, ways that they can get involved, uh, maybe become ambassadors, uh, the, the uh, clean PHL type ambassadors. So I'd like to go over that. Maybe we can talk about that first and then go into some recycling tips. Sure. So, um, yeah, so again, it's, if you're in the Philadelphia area, please um, check out our uh, PhilliCycle page and try to join to get educated on how to educate yourself and your neighbors and community and better the situation around uh, recycling. That's the, the biggest step that, uh, that you can take. Um, also, for people to search their addresses, see what uh, resources they don't have. Um, through the litter index, we ran some um, studies and we found that blocks with block captains tend or are across the board cleaner blocks and then neighborhoods that have mm -hmm. parks friends groups not only have cleaner parks, but also have cleaner neighborhoods around those parks. So mm -hmm. 
it's just kind of a, it's a culminating thing. So we just want to make sure that people know as much as they have. Um, we'll also, we give information about their community organizations that are in the area and how to join them. Because there's a lot of great community organizations. Um, the managing director, Mike DiBaradinas, who's my boss, has a stated goal um, with the mayor's office as well of making Philadelphia the most civically engaged city in the United States. And this is kind yeah. of our piece of the pie to be able to do that, to connect people to their um, their ways to engage. And I'll tell you, I mean, a big way to get people on the hook is through litter because people Litter. Hate yeah. litter. So it's a way for them to kind of get uh, get involved. Um, to get into recycling, uh, the one you know link that I'd sent over to you also you can share is um, Recycle by City. It's a really great um, link in our website basically that uh, does a quiz that's based on your city about what goes in your single stream recycling bin because we have a lot of challenges with people putting the wrong things in their single stream recycling. I can understand that. I went to the list and I thought, oh my heavens, I've been doing this all wrong. <laughs> and I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be conscientious about it. So I, I thought we could just go through some of them, like shredded paper, shredded yeah. paper. You can recycle, but it has to be in a bag that's closed, stapled. And it says marked as shredded paper. Yeah. So that'll sometimes go to specialty recyclers. Even with our single stream, we tell people don't put the bag in your single stream. You kind of have to find, and that's why it's great. There's a lot of People or places that do shredding events that will shred um, paper. Okay. Um, the reason that you can't recycle shredded paper just in saying like just putting it in your blue bin is that, um, and I also encourage everybody, I think I put the link over about the virtual material uh, recovery facility, which is what we call a recycling uh, facility. Let me just tell people again that, um, that all these links are going to be available at sustainabilitynow.global. Go ahead. <laughs> so I hope that everybody takes the virtual tour and sees because recycling facilities are incredible. It's all based on physics and geometry of how they separate all the different materials. The problem with shredded paper is the first entry point of any um, bits of material is um, a kind of uh, a conveyor belt basically that has kind of like slots in it basically that things can fall through, very small pieces. That's for when glass is crushed, all that crushed glass falls through. That's again for people also to know it's not like, you know, the milkman picking up your milk and taking the bottles back. That's not really how recycling works, especially with glass, because a lot of it breaks or whatever. A lot of glass just gets crushed and then used as fills and aggregates and kind of reused in other things. It's basically just, you know, it's back to being sand, basically. Um, but when that glass is crushed, if there's smaller pieces, like smaller shredded paper, that shredded paper falls through as well. So ultimately, mm. it's just going to get thrown away. So if you're doing that, you're not really doing it. We actually use shredded paper in our compost. Um, in, the, in the farm, we have a compost collective at Emerald Street Community Farm, uh, and we use a lot of the shredded paper there. So as more composting kind of gets online, there's other applications for it. Um, but yeah, shredded paper is a, one of those very funny, complex, nuanced things. Yeah, and another weird one, oh, it was, I'm showing my ignorance here, but now I'm educated, uh, was greasy pizza boxes. Yeah. Not recyclable. Yeah. And again, it goes back to, but compostable. So you would be able to compost them. Um, but the reason they're not recyclable and that, and also damp, that's why we're trying to get more bins with lids on top of them because we want our recycling to be loose. You can't send recycling in bags to the uh, facility because people have to open those bags then and dump the recycling. We like recycling to be loose, but when it's wet or there's grease on it, you basically can't process, you can't pulp that paper back into another product. So it's contaminated at that point. Wow. And um Let's see, there was another one that was surprising to me. With um, the, the laundry detergent or cleaning supplies that have the pumps, that's recyclable and you should leave the pumps and the, and the tops on these things. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, we tell people to leave them on, yeah. And then basically there's certain um, facilities, I think a lot of them are based down in the South, uh, that have um, that process, those materials, they just kind of want everything compacted together and then they sort it out, but it all gets bailed into one bail and then it gets sent to certain um, markets down in the South to be turned back into tied bottles. So That's wild. So, um, and how about aluminum foil? It says that we can recycle aluminum foil, but what about the food waste? As long as it's clean, yeah. So if you can take the time to clean your aluminum foil, um, aluminum is a very valuable commodity, um, so there's actually a lot of value in it. So we love recovering uh, aluminum. Cans are huge, but um, yeah, people can take the time just to kind of scrape off a little bit of that food waste, or um, you know, that's a way that we can we can save it. And then also, if you have like a tin, like a foil um, uh, broiling pan or something, pan or like yeah, like you get like a pie that's in. I know they get like the crust things. Um, if as long as it's clean, that can go in too. And again, that's a valuable material. Wow. 
And the other thing that was interesting is not to crush your cans, tin cans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, again, I'm not ex exactly sure about exactly why uh, that one is, but I think just kind of keeping the material kind of in a bit of a constitution. Um, I'm not sure if it's harder to process that metal once it's been bent or anything like that. So there's a, a number of uh, aluminum cans that are filled or that are lined with sort of a Teflon or plastic that keeps the food separated from the metal. Mm -hmm. Are those, what do you do with those cans? Are they trash or are they recyclable? Uh, a lot of times we're telling people just to put those into um, recycling and then it gets uh, sorted out at the plant. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. But again, these are things that it's hard to keep up with, especially in the, in the industry of keeping up with um, as they change products and people change for many different reasons. It could be a health thing or it's better marketing, whatever it is. And just us trying to keep up with that is a challenge. But um, from what yeah. I understand now, even with those, any of those liners um, are able to be put into the uh, recycling. Okay. The other thing that was surprising to me was that uh, paper towels, tissues, and napkins are not supposed to go into recycle. I guess that's because uh, they're soiled then? Soiled and also because so that's one big rule about it, but also there's not, um, it's hard to extract value out of because the paper is made to kind of, it disintegrates pretty easily in water. Okay. So when you have to pulp it, the way that that's made, it's hard to reuse that paper. Um, okay. But then if you have paper that has a bit more of a uh, constitution to it, like a paper plate or, you know, any kind of paper, um, you're able to pulp it easier. So that's my understanding of it. But again, tissue, like, you know, I, I'm fine putting tissues into compost, but tissues, napkins, like I put napkins, paper towels, if I wipe out my, uh, um, my pan, my uh, cast iron skillet that I have in my house, I just put that in the compost. Mm -hmm. So I've heard about worm composting the worm bins that you can have in apartment or in house, as well as um, the tumblers. And do you have a recommendation around composting for folks that are just getting started? Um, I would say if you're just getting started, I would say don't do worm composting. Just get <laughs> challenging um, just to make sure that you're keeping up on it. You're feeding the worms correctly. You're using it, um, the compost. Um, so I would say that's a bit of a challenge. Tumblers are good. Um, again, I, I would just give anybody, um, we have a, a, a link for um, backyard composting, how to like be successful at backyard composting on clean PHL. Um, and composting does, if you're doing it by yourself, you, it takes a lot of attention. You do want to keep up on it. You want to make sure you're getting the right mixtures of material so it doesn't create odor and it's, you know, you built the bin right so it's not attracting um, vermin basically. So right. you're able to be a good neighbor while you do it and do it successfully so you have something good at the end, a nice, good product. And then you have somewhere to use it, you know, and hopefully if you're getting into compost and you're also gardening and you're using this. Right. Right. Good. So is there any kind of takeaway you'd like to leave people with for today? Anything that we could wrap up with? Well, one, I, I really thank um, everyone who has the interest in this and thank you so much, Mira, and this, uh, and, um, the great interview that we're doing, just this interest in waste management and sanitation. Uh, I really feel like this has, one kind of, you know, a utility, something that we need a city service or, a, you know, a societal service that we really do take for granted. I mean, we just, yeah. you know, think you put it in a bin, it goes somewhere. I don't want to know about it. Right. Um, and just like how, you know, with water issues, um, energy issues, you know, these are major human food, same thing. You know, these are major human services that we need to think about. Um, yeah. I've been to countries around the world that don't have sanitation systems set up. I've seen pits and when I come back to Philadelphia and see a trash vacant lot that kind of looks the same, it just, it, it makes me crazy that we have these uh, resources, we have these infrastructures, but we don't value them or use them correctly. So I think just, uh, you know, major takeaways is just getting interested in it, um, knowing kind of what your roles, responsibilities, resources are and the support you can get from your own municipality. Um, that's what we're trying to do here in Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, we hope that our success will show um, Definitely on the litter side, way before 2035, but I, you know, I'm very excited wherever I'll be by 2035 to see that Philadelphia is not using landfills anymore and we are doing really good innovative things with our waste. That's awesome. It's exciting. It's really, really exciting. Is there, is there a book or a couple books that you would recommend to people to uh, dig deeper into this topic? 
Um, there is a, uh, a book that, you know, we first looked at that I thought, and this is, again, it's interesting because it's really kind of got it. Another aspect of the cabinet is behavioral science. So we have a behavioral mm -hmm. science. It's a bigger initiative. A lot of cities are doing this in Philadelphia has this great um, initiative called GovLab PHL, where we're doing behavioral experiments and looking at how we design programs through a behavioral science slash design lens. So mm -hmm. uh, that's really cool. And um, so there was a book around behavioral science around it called Literology, which was really interesting. Um, that just talks about, you know, why people litter, how it happens. Well, Nick, thank you so much for being with us. Much Happy. appreciated. And we're looking forward to getting your message out and seeing Philadelphia be waste, zero waste and litter by 2035. That's wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And so for everyone listening, please be sure to check out our podcast notes on the website at sustainabilitynow.global. And you'll see all the resources there that have been discussed today. And that's it for today. I'm your host, Mira Rubin. And until next time, live your best life, love the world around you, and together we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now, produced by Scott Billy. Visit sustainabilitynow.global for resources related to today's program. And be sure to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media for more solutions to shape a world that works.